the average increase over 10 years is 1.16%. So if we increase that home value by 1.16% each year, and those are cut off. All right. Anyway, that home would be worth $325,000 in 2024. And even though the value of the home went up, the tax rate went down such that that home is gonna pay $666 in school property tax instead of the 970 that it was. That makes sense? And here's the tax rate history. Um, I've got it noted there that there was no debt levy since 2019-20. So uh, it was in 2018-19 was the last time we had a levy to pay down that uh, debt service. And that debt was related to the last referendum that was passed in 1999. So about uh, uh, and I, last capital referendum because we did pass the, the 1.7 million in 2020. Next steps. So like I said, tonight is your meeting. It's the annual meeting for the electors to take a look at the budget, understand the budget and make a decision on whether we wanna move forward with this budget. The board will take that into account when they go and finalize the budget in October. So we are waiting on the student count. The third Friday in September, we'll get our student count. We'll know the number of heads in our seat. We'll know the number of heads that are from other districts. And we'll know, know the number of heads that live in our district but are attending other districts. Put all those num numbers together to get a membership number. We'll multiply by our uh, membership, our maximum allowable dollars per member, and we'll get a revenue limit. From the revenue limit, we'll also have the state certify, not from the revenue limit, I misspoke. We'll have our revenue limit. Then the state will tell us how much state aid they're gonna certify. They certify that on October 15th. When I know those two numbers, we can now determine what the local property tax will be. And so the board will then adopt a budget and a property tax sufficient to operate the school district. That is one of the requirements of a board is to adopt a tax levy and an operating budget sufficient to operate the school district. It's one of their charges. And that happens late October. And then we tell the municipalities this is the tax rate and the tax levy for each of you. And then they send the property tax bills out in December. And then we get our first payment in January. We're halfway through our year already. And we get our first revenue in January, main revenue. And we'll get some other small revenues from the state and stuff earlier, but. Uh, so that, those are the next steps. And that's the end. Is there any questions? Yes. The, um... Yeah. How much time did the school board and or the administration spend trying to influence what happened in the last financial We spent a ton of time on that. We invited our legislators into our office. Uh, they were in here a year ago. Yeah. It was June, okay, I was thinking June or August. And uh, Senator Kappinga and uh, Senator, uh, Representative Duco were in our office. We talked to them, we explained all this, said, we can't compete with the rest of Waukesha County when we have revenue this low. We got a little movement. They brought the low revenue ceiling up $1,000 from 10,000 was the minimum, which didn't help us, to 11,000, which helped us by $53 this year. So we got a little movement, but there's, they're gonna tell us, and I told the board, this is what they're gonna say. They're gonna say, go ask your taxpayers, go for a referendum. And then I said, are you gonna help us? Are you gonna explain the funding formula or, or, or be with me by my side to say that I'm not making this stuff up? And they said, no, I can't do that. Did they tell you that they would not support the $300 million increase in education spending for the state? They didn't, they weren't talking about that at that time. So they didn't say that uh, whether they were not going to support it or not. Now, remember that increase came in the form of state aid, which is property tax relief. Yeah. It's not operating money. Not even sure. Right, exactly. Yeah. I think it's the most not that that we have ever been up with the approval of the budget at the state level. 
Yeah, when Joint Finance Committee uh, oh, had you ask me how much time that was? Yeah. What about collectively rounding all the many of the districts that are in the same position here? Declining state equivalent school system. That's a really good question. And it really is kind of a two part for the first time ever. There were board members that were. There were, there were board members that were exceptionally uh, active. Uh, when joint finance uh, came to Waukesha and held their meeting, uh, not only did Jeff go, which he routinely does, bless his heart, uh, to get the message out, but he was joined by uh, three board members uh, who went to support him uh, and uh, two provided testimony there as well. Uh, and in fact, we were joined by a great number of other schools uh, that are in the same boat as us. In addition, uh, we uh, had a lot of conversations. Many board members called individual legislators, wrote to individual legislators. Our school board meetings, we pumped every single school board meeting. We talked to, uh, about the budget, uh, trying to get our constituents uh, messaged on uh, the need for them to contact uh, their legislators. And when push came to shove and they were in the, the throes of decision making for the biannual budget uh, in June and early July, there was an exceptional amount of time again put forth by uh, certain members of the board as well as Jeff. Hours and hours, correct me if I'm wrong. I was on the phone with Kepinger's office several times and Duco, and at least Duco will call me back. Definitely will. <clears throat> and I'm, not, I'm, I'm good to him, I'm very nice to him. <laughs> I just trying to understand. Yes. Yeah. Part of the finance committee now we've actually established a legislative portion of that, which Lynn is leading up. And I think it's going to be a big part of you know, what we're going to be doing moving forward as it relates to the budget and anything that potential referendum uh, future here. I can also, excuse me, I can also add that um, I actually joined individually with a group called Equity and Funding which that represents, I believe, 60 to 80 districts around the state of Wisconsin. That's also in the same situation we're in. And just met with them for a day-long brainstorming session on how do they want to move forward, knowing how the last um, budget went and what do they want to do um, moving forward in order to get more schools all on board together to have a lot of true voice. Do you think we did a moment they are still determining what next steps are, but they're not going to just sit still and let it just stay the way it's going to be. And I'm Conrad Farner. I'm the new superintendent for the district. I've got a little bit more time to present, but I can tell you the last two districts I've worked for, I've been part of the School Administrators Alliance, the SAA, and that's a statewide group that represents HR directors, superintendents, special ed directors, retired teachers. I feel like there's one other group. And I can tell you that group has been working since the revenue cap law went into place. They've been trying to change this across the state. Every single district has been trying to lobby and work with their legislators to say this is a problem. And I can tell you the single biggest reason why there's never been any movement and they have not been able to change it because there's always winners and losers when you change school funding formulas. And the winners will fight to keep it the way it is. And that doesn't give the losers much chance because no legislator wants to be the one who lost something for their district. Well, I just, I just want to build on that. Is that why uh, Representative Duco and Senator Kaplinger didn't support us? I mean, they, we're there in their district. They, the second that I got is they would support it if there were broader adoption, adaptation for it. The, the concern is it's not, it's not going to hit the level that they need to vote on because nobody in the state wants to take that level. So my, that's my personal interpretation. It's not a matter of them not supporting it. It's, Fact that our state won't even get there because it won't be where we need to go for something. So I don't know if you guys have different perspectives. Like, oh, that's the way I kind of. I, I can't speak for any legislators, but I can tell you the ceiling, the floor that 
Jeff went over how that went up to 11,000. The reason that was able to happen, because that's that was a big change. That, that was one of the biggest changes I can remember in all the years I've been doing this. The reason that was got through was because it didn't take anything away from anybody else. Correct. And if I right. Follow. And there was a big push from this uh, education, I, equity, and education, equity and funding group. Uh, and there was a huge budget surplus. I mean, let's, let's right. be real. Absolutely. The only reason that really all ended up happening is because we had so much extra state uh, budget or revenue saving, whatever you want to call it. So remember, that only helped us by 53 bucks because we were already there. But it did help those that were at 10,000 last year. They can go up to 11,000 this year. That's a big help to them. So frankly, what ended up happening is the state approved. Has the state approved the $12,000 per for school choice students? We being uh, one of what, 10, Jeff, in union districts? Right. Um, we remain less funded than any school choice school moving forward. School choice high school. School choice high school. The high schools are getting over $12,000 per student on a voucher, and we're allowed $11,000 per student to operate with. So there was countless discussion around that just prior to the final decisions. And, and I can tell you that I, I did speak directly with Cindy Duco. She was supportive of bringing us up. Um, Senator Kampika was not. I have to say that this is, this is one of my concerns is we can double the amount of hours that people spend on legislative advocates. And we're up against a, a well-funded lobby that is, that is persuading our legislators to go against our interests. I mean, that's, uh, you know, and I wouldn't want to see our board work any harder on this. I do believe the board work very hard on it. Um, but, you know, with the backing of the Republican Party, even, we weren't able to overcome that. I don't know. I'm, I, I don't like to be someone who's pessimistic, but I'm concerned. I don't, I don't understand that the Congress of Jackson is going to be struggling to provide a point of view on this entire funding and education discussion, but my belief is politicians are counting on their constituents being ignorant to understanding how school funding works. So when you hear politicians, and it doesn't matter what side of the island they are on, when they talk about how they're going to give more funding to schools, more funding to education, challenge them, ask them how, what, what formula are you using? Walk through the formula that Jeff has shown up here multiple, multiple times. She's doing that for a purpose. <laughs> He's doing it to educate the constituents in our district to have those conversations with the politicians, those who are either incumbents or the ones that are running to unseat someone. Likely they're all going to use education as a speaking point. Challenge them how, because even today, I was in a conversation with the constituent about uh, what Governor Evers uh, put money back into education. They truly believe that it was actually a check hidden written to schools to use for educational purpose, to go towards the school's revenue. Absolutely incorrect. It does not be just. So that's the challenge we have. It's going to be more than just what the school board do. It's constituents challenging the politicians who write and set the laws and how it was case with the school board. But the has done a fantastic job of saying it over and over and over again. I think I can explain it now. Not as good as Jeff, but I- That's awesome. That's what I want. I mean, there's 16 people here plus nine board members out of a community of how many? 30,000? We need the rest of them in here. But now you, 16 and nine, have to be the advocates and explain what I just explained. And, and if you aren't comfortable doing that, tell them to call me. I'll do it. Yeah, and I'd love to. It's one question. So if I'm understanding right, the union cap at 11 is lower than any other non-union place. Is that right? No, that's you're you're mixing that's Act 10. You're you're okay. you're mixing up. So this goes back before Act 10. Act 10 happened what year? 2011, I think. Mm -hmm. And in 1992-93 is when revenue limits started. Okay. And so whatever you were spending on operations that year, 
let's say you had a great year and you saved a whole bunch of money that year. Oh, you just got burned going forward. Or what? let's say you had a major expense happen that year. You had to buy a roof and you went into your fund balance to do it. Your expenses went way higher than they normally would. Well, you're lucky because you, you're going forward just like that. Yeah, you know? that, that history that people don't understand, the, the, the whole three-legged stool was put in place. Tommy Thompson was the governor. And I vividly remember this because it was coincided with my first year as being an administrator in public schools. And so I, I'm not to blame, I had nothing to do with it. But I remember it vividly because prior to that, the school boards, the elected officials in their communities could set the levy for what they needed to run their school district. They'd done it for years. And so it wasn't until that law came into place that all of a sudden school boards had to start working under a limit. That was supposed to be a temporary law, as Jeff said. It was only supposed to last two years. And at that point, everybody was kind of like, okay, we can live with this. They're taking these drastic measures, but it's not going to be permanent. And then all of a sudden it became permanent and everything Jeff has talked about, you got punished if you approval. But the thing to remember about why it was passed back in 1992-93, property taxes were going through the roof and taxpayers were going to their legislators saying, you got to do something about this. We're sick of our property taxes going up. And I won't get into the history of why they were going up. It's a pretty interesting story as well. But that's what we're still battling today. And that's the other thing that the reason a lot of legislators don't want to change it is for every parent of a student or grandparent or whoever it may be that has a child in a public school, there's how many other people who don't have a kid in school and all they care about is keeping their property tax as well. And elected officials try to balance both of those constituent pools, but they will tend to say they're going to be pretty conservative and protect the taxpayer. What's fascinating to me, having been there when that law got put into place, the amount of screaming you heard about taxes going up all the time, when's the last time you heard complaints about property taxes? I mean, you saw the numbers. I actually would get a call each year uh, in a former district from someone complaining that their taxes were too low. They, they have gone down dramatically. Like, so the system worked fantastically <laughs> when it came to getting property taxes down, but it has not been good for schools. Right. And we'll talk a little bit more about that referendum when I get my chance, um, because that, that is literally part of school funding now. I was just going to say, um, what everybody said more eloquently than I, uh, the real problem is, is the revenue limits. Uh, but the problem, if you look at it uh, globally as, as a state, uh, all schools aren't created equal. All product, the education product in schools aren't created equal. We're getting an amazing product for very little. And then you're, you you take a look at how this has been spread out. We're making we're getting eleven thousand dollars per kid. You look at uh, a community like like Milwaukee Public Schools that's graduating a nine percent literacy rate, and they're are they up to eighteen thousand now per student? It, yeah, it's, it's up there. It's a it's a ridiculous number, uh, and and the product is is horrible. You know, so how do we how do we solve that problem? It's it's there's so many ways to it. There's so many pieces. So maybe okay. the big the big on all of this is that our legislators, our legislators have clearly signaled to us there is uh, no initiative on their part to change this uh, the funding system. Um, and so uh, they have outright said to us it's reverend. And so moving forward, um, part of the messaging to our community will have to be. Uh, as long as that equation stays in place to fund our schools, there will be a need for referendums and people need to adjust to a, a whole different idea around funding the school. There's a need. Yeah, we're falling behind our facilities. If you just go into other school districts and look at some of their facilities, and if you look at our On Point magazine that went to your mailbox and you see the amount of funding that those districts have raised through referendum compared to Arrowhead, we're at eight and a half million and there's some that are bumping up against 100 million or maybe over 100 million. You're stealing my thunder. Oh, sorry. All right. This is the end of the budget hearing. Thank you for being here. And uh, go out there and help us out. Get the message out there.